Amid sunny orange groves, a dark cloud falls upon a rural family home. A 41-year-old mother is struck down by crippling illness, suddenly and swiftly. Her hair was gone. She weighed probably 90 pounds. Within days, two of her teenage boys are also in critical condition. Doctors find the family has been poisoned with a lethal chemical, thallium nitrate. It's a heavy metal that is not used in many things. It was a banned rat poison. Interferes with everything in your body, gets in your brain, and there's no way to get it out. When death claims a victim, a massive investigation is triggered. To murder somebody by poisoning is exceptionally rare. It is something that has to be thought up. A very demented mind. This is no ordinary killer. Most diabolical criminal I had ever seen. He was a very evil very devious person. A seasoned detective goes undercover at a murder mystery weekend devised by the suspect. One slip could cost her her life. I really took a deep breath and thought, has he seen me? He's not going to get in your face. He's going to poison you so that you die a slow, painful death. Drive far enough along Highway 60 into the heart of Central Florida, and you'll hit Alturas, a town of 500. Citrus groves outnumber people, 20 to 1. And there are lakes as far as the eye can see. Keep driving, and you'll come to a large clearing by the road, and a home where waitress Peggy Carr is beginning a new life. 41-year-old Peggy has spent many years as a single mom raising three children, Jelena, Alan, and Dwayne. We've seen all the heartbreak that she had, you know, gotten in her life that just made us more protective over. My relationship with my mom was um, a great relationship. Um, we uh, were very close, and it was very important to me. Um, she, was, um, she was exceptional. I just never seen my mom really in a bad mood. You know, she was always just full of life, it seemed like. Peggy's kids are thrilled when their mom meets Pi Carr, a phosphate miner. Here comes, you know, her knight shining armor. I was glad of their relationship. I was hoping that Pi was going to be the one. After a whirlwind courtship, Peggy and Pi tie the knot. I can remember she would tend to glow when she was that excited, that happy. And um, I thought it was um, a marriage made in heaven uh, for her. The couple has five kids between them, plus Peggy's granddaughter. They all move into Pies Altura's home. Everybody seemed to really uh, get along well. My mother was happy, and she had the things that me and my brother always thought she deserved. Living in Alturas was great. We thought it was a, a paradise. But only six months after the wedding, trouble is brewing for Peggy and Pie. As the months went by, I started noticing my mom and him arguing more. On October 20th, Pie leaves on a hunting trip. Peggy stays at home with the kids and works some shifts at the restaurant. Three days later... She come home, she was having chest pain. She was talking about how bad her feet were hurting. I mean, they were just excruciating. And I was like, Mom, your feet always hurt, you know? You're, you're a waitress. And she's like, no, no, my feet are hurting. Within half an hour, Peggy is vomiting and in so much pain she can barely move. Pi returns home from his trip and his reaction shocks Peggy's son, Dwayne. Pi didn't want to take her to the hospital. Unable to convince Pi, Dwayne turns to his sister for help. I specifically remember my sister saying, no, I'm taking her, I'm taking her to the hospital. He's like, no, 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 just, it's flu, it's a flu, it'll, it'll pass. Late that night, Pi finally relents. I physically picked her up out of bed because she couldn't walk and carried her to my sister's car because she was in agonizing pain. Doctors run a battery of tests. And couldn't find anything and released her. You know, she's still in agonizing pain. They give her some sort of 
pain medication. Within three days, Peggy is back in the hospital, this time in the intensive care unit. She kept on getting worse and worse and worse. The doctors are baffled by her deteriorating condition, and whatever it is seems to be contagious. Both Duane and his stepbrother Travis are rushed to the hospital. We were both throwing up, super dehydrated. I never could eat anything. The pain that I had was unbearable. It was like a thousand needles just wrapped around your foot. Despite the pain, Duane's bigger worry is his mom. I remember waking up in the hospital, hysterical, what's going on? Where's mom at? Is she okay? Duane is wheeled up four floors to visit Peggy. He's unprepared for what he sees. Her hair was gone. She weighed probably 90 pounds. They had a cap on her. They didn't want to give me the shock of my life to see her laying there. She was able to write on a notepad, my feet hurt, my feet hurt. Duane's brother, Alan, has been away serving in the Navy. He takes a leave to be with his family. When I walked in and first seen mom, um, I hardly recognized her. Uh, she was real pale. Of course, there were tubes and things um, all over. And um, I don't think that mom understood what was going on. Coming home to that was a shocker. Within a week, Peggy falls into a coma, and Duane and his stepbrother show no signs of improvement. There wasn't much that could be done, and we just had to pray. Doctors desperately seek the cause of the illness. Tests for common environmental contaminants are negative. They pursue a more radical possibility and make a startling discovery. In the bucolic town of Alturas in rural Florida, there's been a tragic turn of events for the Carr family. Struck down by sudden illness, Peggy is in a coma while her son and stepson are both fighting for their lives. I honestly thought I was gonna die. Doctors run every conceivable test and finally arrive at a shocking conclusion. I remember they said, yes, we know what happened. And you've been poisoned. We were like, what? Poisoned? What do you mean? Did we eat something bad? The news is infinitely worse. Peggy and the boys have ingested an obscure and deadly substance, the heavy metal thallium nitrate. They said it was a band rat poison and colorless, tasteless. Was this poisoning simply a tragic accident or a more sinister crime? The sheriff's office is determined to find the answer. Certainly in the beginning, murder was not on our mind at all. But we knew something was obviously wrong. How did these people ingest? How did they touch? How did they inhale? I mean, we truly didn't know in the very beginning how this all came about. Susie Shottlecott, a local reporter, catches wind of the story. There was definitely a fear in the community and a concern. People were worried that their groundwater was contaminated. We checked the well water, think there was more than one house on that particular well. No one else was suffering any problems. Tests confirm the well is not the problem. Now they're going to determine what the source of that thallium was so they could put out an alert to everybody who lived in that area. We were looking at every possibility. Prosecutor John Aguero joins the investigation. With all of the groves we have is thallium in some sort of grove spray, insect control, whatever it might be. So they had to research all of that. From there, we asked the authorities, what are you doing? What they were doing was examining everything in the car household. We thought that it was something that they had probably eaten something they had drank. The sheriff's office swabs hundreds of items searching for the source of the contamination. They pretty much scoured the house from front to back. We found the Coca-Cola bottles had been tampered with, and someone had ultimately put thallium in the bottles and replaced the top. Coke laced with the odorless and tasteless thallium. This could be a case of product tampering and the beginning of a nationwide catastrophe. They had people down here who were scared to death to drink Coke. An investigation is launched. The initial step was to look at the bottling company and see what could have happened there. The Coke bottles don't come off one at a time and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're in a huge bunch of bottles that come down this thing, and there's no way for it to have been contaminated at the plant. 
and then end up with all eight bottles having thallium, and that's just not possible. It turned out it was product tampering, but it was at the home. It was not at the store or at the site of where they make Coca-Cola. It appears this was a targeted attack, a deliberate attempt to poison the family with a highly toxic chemical. Alan, Peggy's eldest son, is outraged. I didn't know who or how other than it was um, a deliberate poisoning. Right away, I wanted somebody to pay for it. But who was responsible? When you start an investigation, everybody's a suspect. You have to rule out suspects. And certainly when Peggy was very sick and Pi didn't appear to be, obviously you think of him. But only six months into the marriage, could Pi Carr have a motive for poisoning his bride? Police learned that Peggy and Pi's relationship was rapidly deteriorating. I, I think he treated my mother horrible. I think he cheated on her. I don't think he was there enough. Just days before Pi left to go hunting, Peggy stayed with her kids in a local motel. I couldn't see that care and that concern in, in Pi. I mean, my mom was in the hospital. I don't remember him ever shedding a tear, ever, not one time. Dwayne tells the police he fears the worst. I thought that he poisoned my mother because he wanted out of the marriage. Pi Carr has a possible motive, and because he works in mining, he has access to this restricted chemical. Prosecutor John Aguero researches thallium poisoning. There are like hardly any reported cases of anybody using thallium. It's a heavy metal that is not used in many things. I, I'd never heard of it. Police bring Pi in for questioning, but they're thrown a curveball when Pi hands them a note he claims is from the real poisoner. I'm the one that got it from the mailbox, so I'm inquisitive, so I open it, and uh, out comes this post-it that said, you and all your so-called family have exactly two weeks to move out of the state of Florida or you will all die. This is no joke. It's addressed to Pi Carr with Pi's unique name spelled correctly, which John Aguero finds significant. Had this note that was written to Pi Carr, P-Y-E, it's not spell it like a piece of pie. To write it like that was unusual, and whoever wrote this note knew that. Brought it inside, my mom immediately, you know, didn't think it was near as funny as I thought it was. You know, the kids were laughing and giggling, and, uh, oh, it's just somebody, it's just somebody down the street. She, uh, no, I'm taking it to the police, and she was very upset about it. But Peggy never takes the note to the police. Instead, it's shoved in a kitchen drawer. But why did Pi wait until now to bring the note up with the police? Is he trying to shift the focus away from himself? Her husband was a suspect, Pi Carr, obviously. Surprisingly, tests reveal Pi has thallium in his body, though he has not fallen ill. Pi was a suspect, but he had some of the coke himself. He could have taken a small dose to throw detectives off, but it turns out that almost everyone in the household drank some of the poison coke, even if they haven't gotten sick. Is Pi Carr the wrong man? A sunny, rural Florida town is the site of a dark and twisted crime. Soft drinks laced with thallium nitrate have been planted in the Carr family home. Peggy Carr's in a coma, and her son and stepson are fighting for their lives. Son Dwayne thinks his mom's new husband, Pi Carr, is responsible. I really thought that Pi done it. Though Pi has been the prime suspect, some things don't add up. The whole family, including Pi, drank the poisoned Coke. Everyone in the house had thallium in their system. And months before the poisoning, the family had received a threatening note that suggested they were all targets. Exactly two weeks to move out of the state of Florida or you will all die. Reporter Susie Shottlecott learns from the police that the poisoning of the car's household may not have been the first. Two of the car dogs died suddenly within a couple weeks of each other and the way they died would suggest that they had ingested something the dog had started losing hair one of the symptoms of thallium poisoning was this a rehearsal for the poisoning of the family in this idyllic rural community who could want this family dead an investigation starts from the center and works out starts from the home and works out. Alturas is a very small community, a few hundred people. We started narrowing those people. 
down to, I think, interviewed every single person that lived in Alturas. No one in the community seems to have a motive. Police often turn to FBI profilers for insight. Mark Young has dealt with numerous cases of poisoning. The poisoner often feels like uh, that they've been wronged and wants to correct what they perceive as, as something that's been done to them or is aggravating them. The complexity of the crime helps narrow down the suspect list. The type of poison used was, was not something that you just go buy off the store shelf. So there's some level of criminal sophistication. Coca-Cola agreed to do some testing for the sheriff's department. There's only four, I think, thallium salts, and they introduced each of them into Coca-Cola, and only one of them would not discolor the product or make it bubble out of there faster than you could get the cap back on, and that was thallium one nitrate, and that's exactly what we found. That tells you that you're dealing with somebody that uh, has a high intelligence level. Whoever concocted this toxic cocktail knew what they were doing. As the investigation unfolds, Duane and his stepbrother are gradually recovering, but Peggy remains in a coma, barely clinging to life. I remember me thinking and hoping, you know, everybody tells you, uh, she can hear you talk to her, she can hear you. The doctors have a difficult conversation with the family. That it had um, progressed to the point that uh, she wasn't going to survive. She's not coming back. She's brain dead. It was time to take her off of life support. It wasn't her. She wasn't there anymore. We stood there by mom's bed. We kind of took a few minutes to say uh, goodbye. They uh, said that you're going to see her lungs inflate and deflate, you know, quite a few times, and then uh, and then that's it. That's what happened, and she was gone. The car poisoning is now a homicide, but police still haven't identified a suspect capable of committing this well-orchestrated murder. To murder somebody by poisoning is exceptionally rare. It is something that has to be thought up in a very demented mind by a very brilliant person who thinks that they're smarter than everyone else. Police keep interviewing the locals and finally connect with the folks that live a heartbeat away from the cars, George Trapal and his wife, Diana. They discover there had been several confrontations between the neighbors over music played too loudly by the car teenagers. He comes around and, you know, uh, comes around the fence and, uh, I want to speak to your mother, I want to speak to your mother. And they had words, they weren't kind words. and. Peggy Carr tried to be conciliatory. Sorry, it's a little bit too loud. I'll tell him to turn it down. It won't happen again. And he just ranting and raving and cursing. And he even threatened to report the cars for renovating without a permit. We're going to turn you in. We're going to turn you in. Peggy had tried to be a peacemaker. Told us, you know, we have to live beside this man. He's not going nowhere. We're not going nowhere. We have to befriend this man. We cannot, you know, it's getting worse and worse and worse. The houses were very close together, so I'm sure that they could easily hear the music. There were just things that most neighbors encounter, really. Although the dispute doesn't seem like a strong enough motive, the proximity of the houses would give George Trapal easy access to the car home. There's nobody else around. I mean, it's just those two houses, and then there's nothing. People tend to notice strangers, and under intense police investigation, those details come out. And that stranger identification did not happen in this case. That tells us that the offender must be somebody that lives nearby. But who would ever suspect a poisoning over a neighborhood disturbance, over some kids playing a television or a radio too loud? Police interview George at his home. He tells them he doesn't know anything about chemistry or thallium. When they ask him why someone would poison the cars, he immediately states, perhaps to get them to move. The same message contained in the threatening note. Coincidence or something more? In Polk County, Florida, police scramble to find the person who killed Peggy Carr with poison. The 41-year-old mother drank an innocent-looking bottle of Coke, but it was laced with a rare and deadly chemical, thallium nitrate. Peggy Carr suffered for months and months. 
While searching for the killer, police discovered that there was bad blood between the cars and their neighbor, George Trapal. We knew that he had a high IQ. We knew that he was a member of the Mensa Society. An exclusive social group for people who score 98% or higher on an intelligence test, which fits the FBI's profile of the offender. The more of that planning, the more of that sophistication you see, the higher you might think that this person's intelligence level is. You might also believe that this person has some type of grudge that, that would have, um, the, the word I like to use is leaked somewhere in previous encounters with these people and even other people. Trapal is a software developer who claims to know nothing about chemistry, but that turns out to be a lie. We did a background on George Trapal, and we knew that he was a chemist. George Trapal knew chemistry all right, a skill he used to make illegal drugs. George was involved in a methamphetamine ring in the 70s, and we found out that he was ultimately arrested for that. There's one chemical this ex-con used extensively, thallium. It's considered a byproduct of a methamphetamine manufacturer. And while serving a few years in prison, George actually taught chemistry to other inmates. But investigators are a long way from proving George Trapal is their poisoner. When you have a good feeling that a person is, is responsible for a crime, you can't take that to court. More information was needed to pinpoint this as the right person. Police solve many homicides through interrogation, but decide that approach won't work in this case. Trapel was an intelligent person and, and an egotistical person and felt that he was smarter than the police. Grabbing a guy like that and bringing him in will only make him shut down. We also knew that he was introverted, that he was very quiet, that he was not confrontational. Not the kind of person that's going to go man to man and speak to somebody. So you began to look at uh, that poisoner as kind of a sneaky type of person. Can police outsmart the brilliant Trapal with their own cunning plan? This was not a traditional murder, so we had to use non-traditional investigative techniques. They bring in seasoned detective Susan Gorick of Special Investigations to run surveillance. I started looking through his trash. We were looking for any type of evidence that he may have discarded and possibly um, something about um, some type of chemical purchase. Day after day, Susan and her team observed George, hoping to gather evidence. And I was told to be careful because the person had a photographic memory. So if he saw us, that he could remember our cars or our faces. But nothing incriminating is found. Police fear that a suspected killer may go free. Who would if he had poisoned next? More than three months after the poisoning death of his mother, Peggy's son Alan has no answers. Overwhelmed by grief, he returns to the Navy. I didn't take it well. I got depressed. I got angry. I just, I couldn't handle it. Everybody's been poisoned. He's away, he can't do nothing. You know, he can't be the hero and, and you know, try to, to save us or find out what's going on. And Took all three of those bottles of Tylenol, climbed in my bunk and um, went to sleep hoping that, uh, um, you know, that I wouldn't wake up and that it would be over. At some point, someone found out what I'd done, and um, I, I woke up in the, uh, in the Navy hospital. The poisoning at the Carr household almost claimed another life, and the killer is still at large. The police decide to take a radical approach, an undercover investigation. And that's where Susan came in. Detective Gorick has a wealth of experience as an undercover cop, but there's a heightened risk in assigning her to the operation. I'd been watching him for months, and I was scared to death that he had seen me and would all of a sudden put two and two together and realize who I was. We had to get information, so we chose who we thought would be the best undercover operative, and it was Susan. An opportunity arises to introduce Detective Gorick into George's world through his affiliation with Mensa, an organization for people with genius IQs. George Trapal and his wife were hosting Mensa Murder Mystery Weekend, and it was going to be a three-day event where they would simulate murders for the weekend and people could solve them. 
Detective Gorick develops an alias that will appeal to George Trapal. So we had studied his personality through the FBI with their behavioral scientist. Possibly this person has got some amount of uh, social inadequacy or cowardice, that type of thing. Since Mr. Trapal and his wife had a relationship where she appeared to be the more dominant one, the profiler suggested that I play up to Mr. Trapal's ego. Detective Gorick transforms herself into Texan divorcee Sherry Gwynn. The personality I developed for Sherry Gwynn was that of a victim, one going through a bad marriage. I wore different clothing than I normally would and a lot of costume jewelry. On a warm Florida day, Detective Gorick makes her way to the hotel hosting the event. I went into to register for the weekend, and the first person I saw when I walked in was George Trapal. Detective Gorick is now face to face with a suspected killer. The biggest fear that I had was that he had seen me when I was doing surveillance. I really took a deep breath and thought, has he seen me? And I looked for any recognition in his eyes. What will Trapal do if he recognizes Detective Gorick? In Polk County, Florida, George Trapal, a member of the high IQ group Mensa, is suspected of poisoning his neighbors, the Carr family, killing the mother Peggy. Four months into the investigation, police have launched an undercover investigation focusing on their prime suspect. We had to work into an environment where we could befriend him or create a relationship. Detective Susan Gorick has gone undercover to attend a murder mystery weekend hosted by George and his wife, Diana. The first person she sees is George Trapal. The biggest fear that I had was that he had seen me when I was doing surveillance. I told him who I was, Sherry Gwynn, and that I needed to register. But George Trapal shows no sign of recognizing Gorick, AKA Sherry Gwynn. He handed me the registration package. Detective Gorick discovers that she has to juggle yet another identity, the character she's playing in the murder mystery. The name that he had assigned me was Roberta Putnam, a socialite from San Cristobal that dabbled in voodoo. Drinks are served and the game is on. There was over 40 people there. Participants are dressed up for their roles, everything from priests to CIA agents. There was a hooker, there was a voodoo priestess. George warms up the crowd with some jokes. He got up and told jokes about attorneys, and they were not flattering jokes. George really hated attorneys. Gorick hones in on George and puts this information to use. When he asked me about my background, I told him that my husband was a lawyer from Houston, Texas, and that I had left him and moved here. Will George buy her story? Talked about how he knew someone was lying by the way that their neck muscles moved. It made me very nervous. I kept talking and hoping that he wasn't using me as a test subject. To Gorick's relief, she seems to be connecting with George. He had a lot of ideas, and I just let him talk, and I played up to them. Suddenly, an announcement. The weekend's first make-believe murder has been discovered. It rather caught me off guard. And it's a poisoning. In staging this scenario for the game, was George Trapal drawing on personal experience? I found out that there had been a threatening note, and immediately my ears perked up because a threatening note. A background to the case written by George is even more chilling. One of the paragraphs that he wrote in this report said, when a death threat appears on the doorstep, prudent people throw out all their food and watch what they eat. Most items on the doorstep are just a neighbor's way of saying, I don't like you, move or else. The words are eerily similar to those in the threatening notes sent to the cars just before they were poisoned. When he talked about putting poison on a neighbor's doorstep, it, it really gave me chills. Gorick feels certain they're on the right track. After I read that, I knew that it was just not coincidence. Before the weekend wraps up, Detective Gorick has one last chat with George and his wife Diana, a doctor, and gains valuable information. 
George said that they were thinking about moving his wife's practice and that they would be selling their house. The detective seizes the opportunity. I told him that I was going to be looking for a house because my husband said he would buy me a house in our divorce settlement. George invites her to swing by for a visit. After I talked to my supervisors, they immediately wanted me to follow up. At a murder mystery weekend in Florida, Detective Susan Gorick has gone undercover in hopes of capturing a real killer. George Trapal, suspected of poisoning his neighbor Peggy Carr, has created a murder scenario for the game. Detective Gorick sees an uncanny parallel between the make-believe murder and the real-life crime she's investigating. When he talked about putting poison on a neighbor's doorstep, it really gave me chills. In her guise as Sherry Gwynn, a Texan divorcee, Detective Gorick has gained access to George's home. He's planning to sell, and she says she's in the market. Detective Gorick is hunting, but not for a house. Maybe he'd open a closet and I'd see lab equipment or maybe some chemicals or something that would give us enough evidence to get a search warrant for the house. Detective Gorick is alert for anything unusual. He did show me a small secret passageway that he had built into the library. Upstairs, he did have a mannequin that had some believe some bondage type things. Strange, but not grounds for a search warrant. It seems this mission is a bust. When I left the house, I thought that was going to be the end of the undercover role. But to Gorick's surprise, her bosses want to continue the covert investigation to see what else she can learn about George. FBI profiler Mark Young knows what's at stake. This type of person, if they really and truly develop a bond, if they feel that person is worthy, they might want to let them know about the crime. One time I met him at a park to have a picnic. She plays up the recent divorce of her alias, Sherry. I told him I just wanted to talk about my soon-to-be ex-husband. George is full of devious plans for revenge. One of the ideas he gave me was to ruin my husband's reputation because he was an attorney and send a letter saying that he molested a child. Over the next few months, Gorick, a.k.a. Sherry, has a series of lunch dates with George. Susan had to work into an environment where she could create communication, where she could create a bond, a friendship, in order to have any communications with him at all. George shares some surprising stories. He had told me about a road trip. They'd take Oreo cookies along the way, but they would pick up hitchhikers and feed them the cookies and there was hallucinogens in them, and they would watch the people hallucinate. While Susan is in the company of this nefarious prankster, a surveillance team monitors his every move. It was high stress every second for all of us, but it was certainly more high stress for her. I believe she was in great peril of uh, having her food or drink poisoned. Every time I left the table and came back, I would never eat or drink anything else. It's not someone that is aggressive and just shoots someone or stabs someone. They want to sit from afar and watch someone suffer. The longer you're next to somebody that is that dangerous, the, the more danger it is uh, to you. Before I would meet George Trapal, I'd have to go over in my head over and over and over again everything that I had told him. She has to live that role. That took a lot of mental gymnastics to go through. Your life could depend on you remembering everything. It's coming up a year since the Carr family was poisoned, but Detective Gorick hasn't had a break in the case. You may have many, many pieces of small evidence, but if you don't have the whole picture, you may not convict them. Some of the higher-ups are questioning the value of the undercover operation. Any type of law enforcement agency has budget problems, so certainly it was causing problems because they needed the personnel other, other places. So they had to be convinced why it was necessary to keep going. Just as her department is about to pull the plug, Detective Gorick learns that George and his wife are finally moving, months after she had originally viewed their home. She'd already moved her practice down to Sebring. So far, investigators haven't been able to examine George's house for evidence. There was not a search warrant issued earlier 
uh, because we didn't believe, we being the state attorney's office, that probable cause existed to get the search warrant. Susan Gorick has an idea that will get investigators into the home. In her undercover guise as Sherry Gwynn, she contacts George and asks if she can become his tenant. He said that was fine. In fact, he and his wife had already discussed it. And I sent him a rent check. As soon as Trapal deposits the check, Gorick has legal authority over the property. A team of detectives and FBI agents swarm the house. I took our crime scene section so that they could take swabbings from everywhere in the house. They're seeking any trace of thallium nitrate, the poison used to kill Peggy Carr. We immediately went there and searched everything, took all kinds of tests. Maybe he poured it down a drain, or maybe there would be some in the air conditioner. Some little things that they had picked up and it looked like they maybe they had some residue in it. Could the residue found in various bottles be thallium? What we were hoping was that in a few weeks we would get the results back. But Detective Gorick will have to wait much longer. We found out that there had been a federal bombing case, and the FBI, their priority right then was working on that case. With the clock ticking, Gorick decides to turn up the heat on George. I had George meet me at a um, little picnic area behind a McDonald's in Sebring. Surveillance video captures their meeting. How are you? Fine. How's your world going? Well, not real good, and that's what I need to talk to you about. Okay. I told him that I'd had two detectives come and talk to me when I moved into his house. I think you neglected to tell me something. Oh, what's that? And I said that something happened in your neighborhood. Oh, oh yeah, somebody got poisoned next door. Said who was. That might not be a lot to you, but it's a lot to me. Oh. <laughs> Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> and he said he never caught the person that did it, and it, it really frightened me. He was being very flippant about it. Susan hands him business cards she says the detectives left behind. So I talked about the detectives that had come to talk to me and that they were trying to find him, and he started getting extremely nervous. Okay, about me. He seems to be really interested in me. I really don't know what's going on. Something just isn't falling in place here. I hope I'm not a prime suspect. <laughs> that could be messy. Uh, yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> and I knew right then. There was no doubt anywhere that he's the one that did it. Gorick is certain about George. But has George also drawn some conclusions about Gorick? He asks her more than once to come back to his new house in Sebring with him. So do you want a great tour of the house? Detective Gorick feels she's close to snaring George. She has no idea George has a similar plan for her. Detective Susan Gorick has spent the last year leading a double life. Her undercover persona, Sherry Gwynn, has befriended suspected killer George Trapal at considerable risk to herself. People like George, they don't get mad. They get even. At Detective Gorick's last meeting with George, he asked her repeatedly to come back to his house. So do you want a grand tour of the house? I'll be happy to give you guidance to Has he realized his friend Sherry is actually a cop? Can we take a rain check on it? That rain check may have just saved Detective Gorick from a horrible fate. Susan could have very well been his next murder victim. But after 18 months of investigation, prosecutor John Aguero knows they still don't have a solid case. We just didn't feel there was enough to arrest him and successfully prosecute him. Gorick's last hope is that a vial recovered from the suspect's home will test positive for thallium, the poison used to kill Peggy Carr. I had really not concentrated on that at all because I knew, you know, that's like a needle in a haystack. After three long months, the FBI calls with the lab results. He said, Susan, they found thallium in it. I thought he was just kidding me. And he said, yes, they found thallium. I was just elated. Early the next morning, police descend on the Trapal residence in Sebring with a warrant for George's arrest. I was still not allowed to come out from being undercover. I had him on the phone while law enforcement knocked on the front door and spoke to his wife. FBI. He told me, oh, well, by coincidence, law enforcement's here. But I remember him saying, if you'll give me a few minutes, I have to put something on. 
Trapal's wife is taken for questioning, but she is not charged. Our investigation did not show Mr. Trapal's wife had knowledge of the crime. Authorities searched Trapal's new residence in Sebring. He had a set of very tiny screwdrivers, like jeweler's screwdrivers. We knew that the bottle caps had been pried off very carefully using a small tool. Those tool marks fit perfectly with one screwdriver that was missing in the jeweler screwdriver set. They had a poisoning guide. It told how to poison someone with Valium and what would happen to the body. They even find a reference in George's journal to getting rid of the neighbors. We found chemicals and chemicals and chemicals at George's house. Police look for a hidden room like the one in George's Alturas home. And finally, my lieutenant found a pegboard that had tools hanging on it and found a wall behind it with a door. Looked like a door to a dungeon out of a Boris Karloff movie. And he opened the door, and it was shocking. There was no inside door handle, and it was a freshly painted room. The only window in the soundproof space has been sealed. And there was a platform bed, and at the bottom of the bed were wood stirrups. He was building a bed on which to torture people. I, I was so shocked. He even had a pulley system to lift people. Detective Gorick got very weak in the knees and just had to be taken outside. And I was so glad that I had not gone. They might have not found me. She just saw herself as being the person George had built that for. It was very creepy, very creepy. Nine months after his arrest, George Trapal stands trial for the murder of Peggy Carr and the poisoning of her family. I called him the most diabolical criminal I had ever seen, thought that he had figured out the perfect crime and it almost worked. After four hours of deliberation, the jury returns a verdict, guilty on all counts. George Trapal is sentenced to death. He might have had a higher IQ than most of the world, but he certainly wasn't smarter than Susan. I was relieved because the family needed closure. Detective Gorick's work is recognized with the International Homicide Investigators Association Award for Excellence. She put her life at risk just to, you know, bring somebody's killer to justice, and I think she's awesome. Today, George Trapal continues to sit on death row. A model prisoner, George has had only one complaint. In a letter to the prison, he stated that the other inmates were playing their radios too loud. <laughs>